Let's see, Griff here, Smash Mouth Radio. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Just enjoying the off season. Yes, it, it's an incredible off season. And um, of course, you're never off though. You just had to go cover something else, didn't you? That's true. I was just at um, the Prefontaine Classic, the track meet down in Eugene, but um, pretty low key. <clears throat> so, absolutely. Are you coming to the U.S. Women's Open in Birmingham? No, that is not on my to do list. <laughs> well, uh, that that's all right because it's going to be pretty big, uh, spectacular coming up here. All right. I found your article, and I'm sure you were shocked to get an email about an article you wrote, uh, what, three years ago? Oh, not really. I mean, <clears throat> that article got re read a lot and reread a lot right after Alabama won the national championship. And Tua is a hot topic in college football. And as we, as you just said, you know, there's never really an off season in college football. So quite a few people have actually talked to me about it. So I wasn't that shocked. To get an email, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, so Tua, as you kind of point out, let's go into the story a little bit without me spoiling it, that, you know, obviously we see here that they're a close-knit family. In fact, they, they live just a 10 minutes from me here in the Birmingham area, and uh, you can see that when you're around them. But in your article, you kind of talk about the, the matriarch of this family was the grandfather. Kind of go into that a little bit when you were talking in, in the scope of things with the Polynesian and Samoan influence of, of football. Well, so I had gone to a little background. I had gone to Hawaii to report on a series. That piece on Tua was the third part of a three-part series about how football on the islands had changed since Marcus Mariota won the Heisman, you know, I live out in Oregon. I covered Oregon and Oregon State when I used to work at the Oregonian and obviously very familiar with Marcus and what he had done and what he had meant to the Polynesian community. So went out there and Tua forever has been labeled the next Marcus Mariota. And when I was there, I spent a lot of time around his family. You know, as most people who have been to Hawaii will tell you, there is just this huge extended family feeling there. Um, You know, they call a lot of people aunties and uncles. That doesn't necessarily mean they're blood related to them in any way. Um, But they just believe in everyone being together and everyone in the community being part of their family. And to his grandfather was, uh, you know, was the one who spearheaded that in their community. And he was a hugely important figure in to his life. The one who, you know, dreamed of big things for him on the football field. And I just, you know, I went there. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to write, but it was very clear in spending time with his family and talking with Tuo that the story was really about his grandfather's influence. Yeah, and his grandfather would quote scripture over him and was talking about him. And the odd thing was, and I didn't realize this until I read your article, um, that Tua was doing some kind of, Miraculous may be a little overstated, but some certainly eyebrow-raising things when he was eight years old. Yeah, you know, from a very young age, it was clear that he had a gift. He was really talented, and then he was in a position to be able to show that off. You know, the biggest thing that I think Marcus winning the Heisman has done is made it so that Hawaii is not just a place you go to find linemen. You can go find skill players there, too, and it's also made more kids want to play skill positions. Um, I don't think it was in the two apiece, but in one of the other stories I wrote from there, there was a great quote from a high school coach saying, you know, we've got like 350 pound linemen that now think they can be a quarterback. <laughs> um, but for <laughs> Tua, it was a natural fit. And I guess you're right. Not many of them have been skilled, uh, positions that have gone on to do Well, and here's Tua, and then when they have gone on, they usually, obviously, you're over there, stay on the West Coast. For Tua to accept Alabama, and I know your deal was written before then, but as you look back now, that's impactful because there's been a lot of guys, and Alabama's in with a five-star guy, uh, Fautilele, I think is his name there, you know, that's looking at Alabama. We, We may see an influx start coming to the Midwest and to the East, here from Hawaii. 
Yeah, it was really interesting. I thought that Tua would wind up at USC down in Los Angeles, um, partially because of, you know, his family being able to get there so much easier. It's a long flight (laughs) from Alabama to Hawaii, that's for sure. Um, Obviously, his family moved with him, you know, his parents and his younger brother. um, But he still has a lot of family back in Hawaii. They actually just had a sort of homecoming party for him a couple weekends ago because I still talk to his family and still talk to his aunts. Um, You know, but not every kid is in that position. Not every family is in that position to be able to move. But it is interesting to think about um, more Polynesians coming to the South to play football, you know, where football is king. Um, I wrote about this when I wrote on Tua, and then Tua brought it up in his post-game press conference after Alabama won the title in January that the things that are most important in Hawaii, faith, family, and football, that's mirrored in the South. And so there's actually, it's actually really similar in a lot of ways, and I was struck by that when I was in Hawaii, just the way that this sport kind of dominates their lives, not in a bad way, but just in the same way in the South, that this is what it means to be from this area. So I think in a lot of ways that transition makes a lot of sense. No doubt. And Lindsay Schnell, our guest here, who wrote an article a few years ago, you can find it on SI.com. That's just an amazing deal called The Island's Next Great Quarterback, Tua Tonga-Vailoa, and the story of the band who inspired him to soar. I'm sure you probably took copious notes and you probably could have written a book on this experience. Was there anything in the article that didn't make it that is just interesting to you as you sat there and uh, got to know this family? Oh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I did feel like I could write a book after. It's funny, too, because, you know, I would like to write a book someday. And writing that three-part series gave me a small glimpse into what it could be like. And (laughs) I'm not sure I can do it. Um, I... uh, you know, the the thing that I'm interested in is I was obviously in Hawaii, but football and rugby and, you know, it's like a lot of people start in rugby and then become football players is so big also in Tonga and then in Samoa. And it would be really interesting to me to go to those places and see the, you know, the lineage how they eventually moved to Hawaii a lot of the time in order to get exposure and better coaching and all that, but just how important it is, you know, because I live on the West Coast, the Pac-12 has recruited kids from Hawaii for years. Um, You know, so that was not, uh, I, I covered Oregon State for a long time and heard so many stories about coaches going to those, to the islands, and what, it, you know, like how it's really hard to get to Tonga, for example. Um, right. And what it just, what a different culture it was, what an experience it was part of. And I wrote this in one of the other pieces. Coaches love them because, like, love Polynesian players because in so many ways they do fit the stereotype of being, like, men who, men and women, you know, who love and care for their families so deeply and they buy into their teammates being their family and the impact that that has. So I think the whole thing is fascinating. I mean, obviously I left a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor, but again, I would encourage people to go read the three pieces because it helped. They're all linked together, you know, and explain Marcus's impact. No doubt. And, and, and some weird things you wrote in there that I, I had no idea. First of all, Talia's name, and he's at Thompson High School here in Birmingham. Uh, his first name means Battle Strong. thought that was interesting. But Tua's real name, and I'm going to try it here, is Tua Nig- Niga Manuela, La- Man- Manuela Pola or something like that. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'm glad they call him Tua, by the way. But <laughs> just, just amazing uh, stuff there with their lineage and names and it's kind of like um you, you know i guess european countries or whatever where, where names have meaning in their in their culture yeah absolutely and the part about how the grandfather typically names the firstborn son in a family that was really interesting to me um you know just being able to like break down what his name means that took a lot of i did i did a lot of academic type of research for that article yeah. Um, because it was important to me to get it right. 
Um, and it's funny because the when I explain his name and what it means and how he got it, that's an extremely condensed version of, the prof- <laughs> of what the professor told me that I talked to. It was a much longer email. Um, but yeah, I just think that that, I find Polynesian culture fascinating personally. Um, and I think that we're just going to see a more and more of an influx of it, like I said, and not just the linemen, but the skill positions. And it's good, you know, what Marcus has done really, and Marcus was not the first, but in so many ways he has paved the way because he did it on a very big stage and was so humble. And then to see how Tua has done it. You know, I loved in the national championship game after Tua threw that interception that he walked over to Nick Saban and put his arm around him <laughs> like, Coach, don't worry, I got this. The, the super laid back attitude of Hawaii, that was just, that moment epitomized it. And I was in the press box laughing, texting with Tua's high school coach about it. And uh, it's kind of crazy to think about that laid back Hawaiian time type <laughs> attitude being part of Nick Saban's, uh, you know, room and program. So, yeah, it, it was crazy. And also synopsized when he took the sack and Saban's reaction, which I'm sure you've seen. And then the next play, the joy of throwing off his headsets running. You know, I think that's why he, <laughs> yeah. he's, he said afterwards, this was, and most coaches don't, as you know, they say, oh, they're all special. He said, no, this was the most special, perhaps, of all the ones he's won. It's kind of crazy. You know, right before when Tua went in, I got a text from another Power Five head coach who had recruited him who said, this kid's about to do something special right here. And, um, I was like, you really think so? I mean, they were in a position, right? Where like everyone knows that. Jalen Hurts is extremely talented, but is not a great downfield passer. So it was, you know, semi a desperation move. But anyway, obviously, you know, they come back and whatnot. And then right before Tua threw his touchdown pass, that coach texted me again and said, just watch. (laughs) I was like, do you have a faster feed than I do? I mean, I'm at the stadium, but how do you know this is about to happen? Um, And the attitude seems to be after watching him, you know, in his first year do that, like, could he, he do that three or four years in a row? Wow, isn't that amazing that, that somebody else see it? And so you weren't surprised knowing what you've known and learning what you knew. Like a lot of people have tried to explain it. Oh, it was luck, and, you know, he hadn't played but one half in the previous five games. So he just came in and was hot. And, and and I've seen practice 50 times when he's there, and I was saying all along, this guy is just special when you're around him watching him throw and prepare and, and do virtually everything. Yeah, I think that, number one, he has supreme confidence. But he, that confidence is really within. He's not like a lot of, quite frankly, like diva, 16 and 17 year olds that we see a lot on like the football seven on seven circuit, you know, early on. But also I, I do think that there's an element of, again, going back to that laid back Hawaiian attitude. I don't know that he really feels pressure. Um, there's, they just believe so deeply and a big part of it is his faith that whatever's supposed to happen is going to happen. And he can trust that and, you know, do everything he can within his control, but just doesn't. And I would say Marcus was the same way, you know, not anxious. Yeah. And the other thing that, no, I, and I agree with that. And I think it's kind of cool. I, I, I'm sure they would text and communicate because I, as you know, Marcus is right up the road three hours in Nashville you know, so that that's kind of neat. The other thing I thought was cool about the article is obviously he had an Oregon jersey with Marcus being there. He grew up rooting for USC, which is one of the teams he was going to transfer to if he had not have played at Alabama in that last game. Um, but you have a line here where you said he is both intrigued and uneducated about the SEC because he's typically snoozing <laughs> when these games kick off. So at this time, Alabama wasn't even in the picture with Tua. No, I mean, but that was, I was there his junior year or his yeah. sophomore year. I think his junior year. Yeah, he, I mean, I don't think, I remember his dad saying, you know, it's the SEC, like, and that is supposed to mean something. But again, like, they're usually asleep when those games are being played. 
Yeah, there's no doubt uh, about that. Lindsay Schnell, our guest here, just for a couple of more minutes. Um, it's a fascinating read. Again, the best way to do it is go to si.com and just kind of, or you can Google, obviously, uh, Lindsay Schnell, S E H N E L L, and, and Tonga Vailoa's. It's the next great quarterback to a Tonga Vailoa and the story of the man who inspired him to soar. Um, I'm sure you heard Trent Dilford just going off on Tua before anything happened. He has done it again recently on Rich Eisen's show. So as we wrap up, none of this, I guess, as you got to know the family a few years ago, really surprises you as far as the success he's having, does he? I'm, I'm sure you were just sitting there kind of smiling about it. Yeah, I was stoked because I was like, I know this kid and this family better than anyone. <laughs> From a reporter's perspective, I was all about him playing well because I knew I would get good stuff because I wrote a good piece then the night they won also because I called back to Hawaii and spoke to his high school coach, you know, who told me they're partying in the streets. I can hear people down the block. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, we're kind of at the point in collegiate athletics, in my opinion, where we've seen so much and we've seen Alabama do basically everything. I don't think we should ever be surprised by any, any game they win. Um, that it was a freshman was incredible and that they had so many young kids in general, you know, playing important roles that game, if I remember correctly, was impressive. But, um, no, I'm really curious to see his past. You know, how do you balance both him and Jalen Hurts? Like, when he first got there, when he first committed, I remember I said to someone, there's no way that's going to last because he's not going to play for a couple years. I bet they wind up transferring back to the Pac-12. But now, I mean, I don't know – you guys would know better than me, but I would assume two will be the starter on day one. I could be wrong, that, but it has been said, but I think that's the way it's going to turn out. That's my personal belief. Again, just from watching him on the practice field and, and, and what he did in the championship game, you know, I mean, I don't know how any other way you could see it. You right. Know? So, right. It, so he's, he's awesome. And I said to an Alabama fan, um, when I was walking out of the press conference, this, I have no idea who this woman was, but she said, gosh, he gave such thoughtful answers. And I said, he's such a nice kid, and his parents are awesome, too. And I get asked a lot as a sports writer, you know, who are you rooting for? And for the most part, I don't have a dog in the fight. I just root for people who are nice to me and easy to work with. And he <laughs> qualifies in both those categories. 